Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Tuesday afternoon edition of Bull Sessions. My name is Mark Robertson. I am founder and managing partner of Manifest Investing. I'm joined here by Kim Butcher, hailing to us from uh, sunny Florida. Good, good afternoon, Kim. Good afternoon, Mark. It's nice and sunny, and when we're done, it'll probably be pool time. <laughs> with an Mental umbrella, time with an umbrella drink, it. perhaps? No, 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 no. That's too early. You know, at five o'clock is when you have a cocktail and then you start with dinner. It's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> hey, uh, Ken Kabula is unable to join us for the start today. He will attempt to uh, join us uh, during the session. We think we've got uh, a pretty cool session. I, I really like the way some of this stuff rolled out as we prepared for this one today. Uh, as most of you are aware, and most of you have probably read the letter to the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders that comes out every year on the last day of February, there are about, and uh, he shared his thoughts on 2020 and uh, the investing landscape going forward. So we're gonna take a, mo a few moments to uh, spend some time with his words and uh, take a look at the dashboard for Berkshire Hathaway and just some of the nuggets that came out of this year's report. Um, reliving some, reminiscing a little bit about the past, but, uh, looking at what direction they seem to be aimed in. I was going to take a look at the profitability profile thing that we do from time to time, and I had ranted about a few weeks ago. Some of you will remember that. Um, uh, basically did a comprehensive update that puts us in a pretty, pretty nice spot to take a look at it in the proper context and perspective. Did want to take a moment to celebrate Tin Cup. It has been going it's reaching escape velocity. It actually kind of frightens me a little bit. Uh, it's it's the tin cup demonstration portfolio at Manifest Investing is doing very nicely. Again, knock on wood, throw salt, salt, whatever you got to do. Um, it, it's really kind of neat to see it uh, rolling out as it is. One last excerpt there on the mall living. Uh, we're going to just take a quick note at some of the strip malls and the, the malls that are kind of dormant these days are actually beginning the process of exploring, putting in residential units inside some of these basically abandoned malls. Kind of a fascinating concept and it dovetails real nicely with that uh, portfolio suggested by Ken Kavula last week. So we'll take a look at the Kramer turnaround portfolio and just some thoughts on how that might tie into that. So with hey, that- Interesting question that's been posed. Um, is Tim Cup going to address how it will handle RMGs? Is who going to address? Tin Cup. How it will handle? Is Tin Cup going to have to address how to handle RMDs? RMD. Is Tin Cup, is tin cup a uh, a IRA that you end up having to take RMDs oh. with your 72, or is it just a taxable account that you never have to take anything out? We treat it as a, a model retirement vehicle. I mean, the theory in theory, it would be uh, similar to a 401k. If that 401k had been invested in the maximum amount that could be invested into stocks since 1994. So yes, I suppose at some point within the next 10 years or maybe a little bit sooner than that, uh, Kim was referring to required minimum distributions. Um, yeah, that, that's something that we could end up talking about at some point because it is treated as, as if it were a retirement vehicle. So yeah, it, it could be a, an interesting way to look at it. I've, I've had to help investors with required minimum distributions, RMDs, over the last several years. And it is it is a component of portfolio management. You know, when do you sell? How do you sell, et cetera? So good question. Good question by Matt Spielman. It seem, seems like a, it's just not in my frame of view yet, but it's, it's, it's coming. It's coming to... We're reaching that point. Let's go ahead and get the legal paper, paperwork out of the way here. No investment recommendation is intended. We are going to be talking about real stocks, specifically those stocks in the Berkshire Hathaway and Jim Cramer turnaround portfolios, as well as Tin Cup. 
Everything that we do here is for illustration, and I would say demonstration, all about education. And uh, what you're going to see is a series of demonstrations of the philosophies and analysis methods and techniques of the modern investment club movement as we've interpreted at Manifest Investing or has been championed for over eight decades by the National Association of Investors, uh, now known as Better Investing. Uh, it's a powerful community of wonderful investors. And again, good afternoon, everybody. And let's just uh, put our heads together and share some ideas and figure this stuff out. It's a quick reminder, we do a monthly webcast called The Roundtable. It's generally on the final Tuesday of every month at 8.30 Eastern time. We've been doing it for nearly 11 years. If you'd like to be added to a reminder list for The Roundtables, you can write to, send an email to nkabula1 at comcast.net. If you'd like a copy of the slides or if you have follow-up questions or suggested topics for future bull sessions, please send an email to me at Mark R at manifestinvesting.com. We don't yet have a, a reminder list for the bull sessions, but uh, that's a work in progress too. We may add that here shortly. A couple of you have asked about it recently. All right, here's the bullpen. Just a, just as a quick reminder of some of the stuff that we, we do, we want to look at uh, some of the things we kick around at Manifest Investing with respect to discovering actionable ideas to invest in, or to build and maintain portfolios. Uh, today's session is going to focus in on booking by Berkshire. And uh, that uh, link, if you're on the Manifest Investing Forum, that would be an active link, The Art of Stock Picking, actually will take you back to an article by one of my favorite authors, Kim Butcher. Kim, well, Kim wrote that a couple years ago, and it's, it's, still, uh, it's still good stuff, Kim. Well, thank you. I have to say that um, writing that article and then actually you posting it was like, oh my God, nothing I even imagined would ever happen. <laughs> Me, a published author. <laughs> well, it's good stuff. It's a good summary. So we'll be t spending a couple of moments with that and reminiscing a little bit. But uh, uh, I do think that there's some interesting moments and things that we can take away from today. Again, the mention of that profitability profile, I think it does bring into better focus what lies ahead, what, and also what seems to be in the heads of the general analyst community and it's something that we do uh, follow. Again, keeping in mind that they don't have to be right. Uh, what they're thinking and their general tendencies and trends and all that stuff influences the world of investing. So it's something that we keep track of very carefully at Manifest Investing. So it's something that we just wanna take a closer look at. We will ten up and then we will uh, leave the floor open for questions if we can get to them. Again, if you have a topic you want us to cover, as you'll see as we go through the session here today, we're coming back big on uh, the buyback question. I think that's on here somewhere. I thought it buyback. was. Buyback. Yep, you have it. Where's it at? Bull string or bull? Right mm -hmm. beneath the building real money. How come I can't see it? There it is. Oh, here it is. Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll be coming to that one, back to that one big. All right, so let's go ahead and get underway. We actually have three charts that we're going to focus on here today. The first one is the Berkshire Hathaway book value per share from 1990 through 2020, along with three years of estimates. And these are according to value line out on the right-hand side of that chart. And depending on how you measure it and, you know, where you start and end and or how you do it, you end up with a, a return, an average performance of somewhere in that 14 to 16 percent range. And again, putting that in context, that's that's simply huge. It's it's basically beating the market by five percentage points over a 30 year period. And again, that places and, and he's, he's been there forever. Uh, Mr. Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway in the realm of super investors and it is uh, it, it really is a phenomenal track record you'll see that he documents a performance of 20 percent based on annual percentage change in market value since 1965 and what's kind of fascinating is he used to focus completely on book value and he changed from book value to market capitalization or market value last year and uh we had talked about it being book value for a long time as 
somewhat of a defense or a justification for the way that we treat all uh, asset-based companies, mostly banks and insurance companies at Manifest Investing, you know, using book value and return on equity predominantly and uh, basically ignoring revenues or at least giving it, uh, you know, second tier status. And uh, they made that shift. And I, I think it really is uh, driven by the larger number of industrial companies in the Berkshire portfolio. They basically have reached this point where they're owning companies like Apple in a big way. We'll see here in a minute. And uh, the the insurance, the property and casualty insurance business is still a, a hefty piece of the Berkshire portfolio, the total portfolio, but it's not as dominant as it once was. And that in combination with the tax laws, which he has, has railed about over the last couple of years, um, they made that switch. And it actually comes up to a better number for them. But um, I still like the idea of the intrinsic value of the business that they've talked about for decades and and uh, that sort of stuff. All right. So, Kim, we'll let you reminisce a little bit here. Okay. Well. Can you, can you share for the audience, you know, how many of these have you been to? Well, I started in 2015, and I've missed the last two because of COVID and family issues. I My philosophy was may as well learn from the best. Uh, there's so many other people there that are similar investors the way we are. I've met a lot of really interesting, great people. I still keep in touch with one out of Colorado, one out of Germany, a couple out of New York, one out of Texas. Um, and it's it's fun. And so you get a group of people together and uh, I believe Chuck Lines here and he's from Omaha. He told us all the ins and the outs of the places to go. Local knowledge. So we make a four day weekend of it and I just am in heaven. <laughs> well, what what? Can you capture or, you know, what stands out to you as a benefit to an investor to attend? And in fact, everybody here can attend. They're going to do the broadcast by CNBC and Yahoo on March 1st. Um, Charlie is actually going to stay home and Warren's going to fly out to uh, Los Angeles for the first meeting, I believe, ever outside of Omaha. They Correct. talk about returning next year, but I don't think Charlie's able to travel these days. What? What type of, uh, what's your biggest takeaway? The biggest takeaway is like-minded people on the way they invest and they like great value. So when you're, t when you can talk to anybody and you're talking about a stock, um, I guess the biggest thing, it's like-minded investors where sometimes when you've talked to people about how you invest, they're looking at you like, oh my God, you're not doing momentum. You're not doing options. You're not doing every all these other things. And I'm like, you know, slow, steady and, you know, 20% historical return like Buffett's gone. I'm not going to complain with that. That's doubling my money even faster than every five. And it's because so many people are similar and their thought process and you get to talk to everybody talks to you like an everyday investor whether or not they're the hedge fund guy out of new york or a private investor out of uh germany because actually there's two of them out of germany i keep in touch with yeah so it's, it's fascinating and um as marcia's asking it's may 1st and uh it's going to be on Yahoo or CNBC and usually just to make you aware in case you're insomnic, Becky Quick usually does a, a couple hour interview prior to. So yeah, they're going to do, they're going to do a Q and a session from, I believe one, th one o'clock or one 30 until five o'clock. And then the Berkshire actual corporate annual meeting will run from five o'clock to five 30. I'm pretty sure that specific time on May 1st. So they're going to do the the three hour Q and A thing, and I, I find it. I mean, how do, how do they entertain for three hours, Kim? 
you would not believe the number of questions. Um, they have three financial reporters that if you have a question, you can send it in to these financial reporters and they will pick and choose which questions seem to consistently, um, some version of the question is getting asked and then they pose it to Warren and to Charlie. Mm -hmm. And what they did at the actual meeting itself is you would have, let's say three questions from each of the three uh, individuals that are chosen and then they would go to a person who's standing at a microphone in the audience so it's possible you can if you got a question you can walk up and ask it at the meeting yeah it's fascinating I, I mean i have never watched one from beginning to end but i've watched a number of questions and it's always been quite entertaining i think we should probably give a shout out to ron brune there he's uh oh yeah well, he's yeah ron brune and that's uh, uh that's a cool sensation Bakula Lala, these are all people from within our community, uh, wonderful investors, and uh, again, a, just a, probably a wonderful weekend. I got to say the bear kind of scares me a little bit. That's not the friendliest looking polar bear I've ever seen. Well, one of the things that we did do is we, um, it was my investment club who went on this uh, endeavor, and we all got green shirts, and we all had um, bionic investments. Uh -huh. And underneath, we had better investing. And you should have seen, yeah, man, we got a lot of questions over that one. <laughs> All right. So Kim's article is featured at Manifest Investing this week. And you can actually access a public version of it uh, using that link at the bottom. So let's go ahead and press forward because I'm, I'm sure people are not here to hear us reminisce too much. But it, it's worth making the point. What I did is I put together the, the dashboard on the equity portfolio. Keep in mind that Berkshire Hathaway has a number of companies that they own, the insurance companies like Geico and various other businesses, Seize Candy, the Furniture Mart, uh, just a whole bunch of different businesses, uh, a railroad, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad, the utility that you may have heard mentioned in the green room. They've got this whole bunch of embedded, wholly owned investments that form this, uh, this behemoth uh, conglomerate. And, and Buffett talks about conglomerates quite a bit. Um, and then they talk about the equity portfolio that gets a lot of attention from people like us. And uh, what I did is I basically threw together a dashboard and I thought Kim and I could spend a couple minutes just kind of capturing highlights. Um, it's a it's a dashboard not unlike many of our own dashboards. Um, and, you know, if you were to make comparisons between this and the, the roundtable tracking portfolio and you know, some of the club dashboards that we've seen, the tin cup that we'll look at here in a few minutes, uh, pretty comparable top to bottom. Um, what what kind of, what jumps off the page here for you, Kim? Well, the first thing I recognize is healthcare stocks because that was where I, you know, did my primary wage earning days, you know, and they've got DaVita and DaVita is a very interesting play because anybody who has, any kidney failure going on, Davida is the one who do the management of the dialysis. So you've got you've got that, you've got a Abv, you've got Merck, Bristol Myers Squid. A lot of these stocks in the healthcare area, I've got a lot of runway still to grow with the growth. So sometimes I will be the first to admit that when I need to go find a stock for my portfolio, I may go see what Berkshire Hathaway has to see if um, something would be good for my portfolio and growth. Um, okay. Actually, Charter Communications is the, uh, I had never heard of it. And then I heard about all the other stocks that Charter Communication has, and it's a play on streaming and cable and all that. So, you know, these are the big names. Like if you have American Express and Visa, there you go. MasterCard, all of them are in there. Yeah, in fact, um, that came, I was going to mention that too. That came up when, when Jim Cramer was talking about companies that will be likely to benefit from the turnaround notice that uh, these are all covered in the berkshire hathaway portfolio you've got all the major card companies and some of them fairly attractive compared to the average stock being right at six percent these days it's actually closer well, to five percent well I guess, think about it and then kroger how many of us are ordering our food from kroger 
Mm -hmm. And then banks, you know, Amazon. Now you can get food off of Amazon. You can go to Whole Foods and use your um, Amazon sign in and get an extra discount there. Also, a real interesting play is, is you've got um, Moody's. And if you look at Moody's and you've got uh, S&P Global and Okay, I'm going to draw a blank. There's only three companies out there on the stock market which are in that niche. So yeah, IHS Market is is basically being acquired by S and P Global. Yeah. Well, I guess the thing that really jumped at me, and I I sort of knew this, but you know, kind of like when you're sitting around playing Trivial Pursuit and somebody blurts out the answer and you knew it, but well, at least I do that. I don't know about you guys, but this kind of stunned me. We're talking again, we're talking about just the equity portfolio. So these are the, you know, partially owned companies, obviously. Um, 45% of the equity portfolio at Berkshire Hathaway is now Apple. And that, that really kind of stunned me. Uh, and they've sold some. As Kim was sharing beforehand, uh, they've actually sold some from the portfolio. So this is ranked by the, the largest positions down to the smallest positions. These are the top 23. We're going to look at the, the lower remnants of the portfolio here in a minute. But a Apple kind of surprised me. And uh, it, it certainly should be a focus of uh, Coombs and Weschler uh, going forward. And then the other thing that is, is pretty dominant here are the banks. Because he sold off, they, I should say, Berkshire Hathaway sold off uh, several banks, including PNC, Wells Fargo is down in the portfolio. Uh, there's a number of companies that have taken a smaller position, but Bank of America is still, you know, prominent. So is U.S. Bank Corp. Um, yeah, I think he added to U.S. Bank Corp in the last quarter. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. And uh, there was an energy addition here with Chevron. So, uh, yeah, there have been some changes here lately. So again, just uh, just in general, just noticing some of the areas that they've been emphasizing and working on. Uh, the one thing that we're going to take and set aside and cover in detail is this notion of buybacks. Because Buffett actually talks about in the newsletter, talking about how they gained uh, a larger position in Apple by virtue of the stock buybacks, a bigger piece of the comp company that is Apple. And... Uh, they actually, for the first time in a very long time, actually bought back shares of Berkshire Hathaway. It's kind of fascinating because I think the value line team missed it in their in their current report. The current company updated that value line does not reflect it, but I checked a bunch of sources and yeah, you've you've had a number of shares of Berkshire Hathaway uh, taken off the table and bought back in the last year, and he he talks about it in the annual report. So watch for some changes to be made there and uh, a deeper discussion as we talk about, you know, the benefits of stock buybacks by companies. And uh, Dilbert down in the corner uh, probably has some better ideas than whoever that finance manager is on the left in the lower side. Um, hey, Mark, here's a quick question for you. Of the total percentage of the portfolio is Apple at 44.7. I'm curious, did you have this at the bottom and find out how much cash is in their portfolio and what percentage is that of the portfolio? How much cash? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if that's actually provided. Uh, our analysis does not include cash. And I don't think it's actually spelled out in the annual report, but I'll go back and check that. After this well, trip. I mean, it, it makes me wonder if I'm adding up numbers quickly. 2.7, round it to 3, 3, 3, 6, 9, uh, 16, and 8, uh, it's 24. Well, this is just a, this is a partial listing of the equity portfolio. And the other, right. th the other thing you have to remember is they have holdings in Occidental and that's in preferred shares. And they've got, in fact, we're going to talk about this one in a second. I've never heard of this company before. Itochu, um, Japanese company. It's actually a pretty sizable investment that they have. And Kraft Heinz. So you, you, it's tough getting it to add up because of the way that you have to account for some of uh, those. But 
we'll take a look at what the total portfolio looks like. Um, I do want to take a moment to do a shameless commercial. When you look at these two here, Snowflake and Stone Company, those are the, actually the only two small companies in the equity portfolio. And uh, here's a little shameless promotion for you guys to save the date. Uh, Successful Investing 3 will be our next online conference between May 12th and 14th. And uh, it was just it's just simply time for uh, when we see that uh, it's a time for uh, an update on the selections that were made by the stock panels at the sessions from May and November. And the reason I remember it is because when Pat Donnelly presented Stone Co., ticker STNE, he, uh, he basically said that during this, you can go back and listen to it. He says, Warren and I went shopping for a stock and we decided on this technology company that works with restaurants and fancy high tech ordering from menus, STNE. And uh, that's the one he featured during the stock panel uh, at a stock price of 22. It's now at 89, meaning that since May, Pat's up 305% in Stone Co. along with Buffett. And you can see that it's actually put Stone Co. you know, onto the top 20 listings of Berkshire Hathaway. So kind of fascinating. So again, shameless promotion. We are putting together a, another uh, capable stock panel, including most of the, if not all, of the names shown on there, along with a couple other guests that we're going to ask to join us. And uh, just a whole lot of fun. We'll have a number of classes, probably talk about projected return on value and where to find ideas and just all the sorts of things that we typically talk about. So save the date. You'll be seeing more on that uh, as as Ken and the team uh, put more details together. But really got to enjoy uh, Pat Donnelly's moment there. All right, here's the rest of the portfolio, Kim. Uh, and that, that's what you were probably trying to add up. Um, it would normally add up to about 289, uh, but some of these companies are not covered yet by us. We're going to be looking at these, um, and then the, you have those other positions in those kind of unusual companies, and we're going to look at one of them here in a minute. The dashboard itself is accessible via this public dashboard link down at the bottom. Um, I'm not sure there's anything there at the bottom that jumps out at me. I do think. I would want to understand because I do not know this company. How about you or anybody in the audience, Ken, Kim? Store Capital? Never heard of it. Never heard of it. It's got interesting characteristics. So it might be worth taking a little bit closer look, but you can see more healthcare. Um, interesting that uh, we've, we've talked about Marsh and McLennan as being one of those companies to, to benefit from the housing boom, no matter who wins. On the, yeah, Cynthia is telling us that store capital is a REIT. Store capital is a REIT. Uh, can we yep. get any more specific as to what they actually do? Because I didn't get a chance to look at it before the session. Uh, uh, Cynthia and Kay told us it's a REIT, but that, that's about it right now. Okay. Again, I think it's worth digging into for personal portfolios. On The REIT disclaimer that you hear us kind of hinting at here is, if you are working with an investment club, the addition of a REIT to the holdings of an investment club can make it very complicated for the club treasurer and for tax reporting. And we generally discourage REITs in most uh, investment club slash partnership type accounts for that reason. And uh, so, but it can still work in a personal portfolio for sure. All right, let's Here go ahead and take. Cynthia is telling us that Store Capital Corporation is an internally managed net lease re real estate investment trust that's the leader in the acquisition investment and management of single tenant operational real estate. Its target market and the inspiration for its name store. It's one of the largest and fastest growing net lease re REITs and owns a large, well-diversified portfolio that consists of investments in more than 2,500 properties across the U.S., all of which are profit centers. Uh, they are up straight and parallel on an SSG. Okay, we'll take a look. Maybe, maybe they're one of these that could benefit from the conversion to, to the residential space that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. Who knows? You never know where this stuff leads you. All right, just one quick other look at Berkshire Hathaway. A couple of things which I found a tiny bit surprising. Um, 
some of the Coombs and Wessler effect here, I, I think, uh, in their portfolio management over the last several years. Uh, nearly 50% in technology, of course, a lot of that has to do with Apple. And uh, I was kind of stunned that they don't have a few more faster companies. Those two companies we highlighted make up that slice, uh, Stone and the, the other one. Um, they do have a lot of workhorses, a lot of medium-sized workhorses, which should never be neglected in uh, in portfolios. Companies like Middle B and, and that you want to have in there. So, again, dominated by the larger blue cap companies, many of those financial uh, behemoths. And uh, and the workhorses dominate Berkshire Hathaway. No surprise there. They like established businesses that are run pretty well, exceptionally well. The one that uh, jumped off the page at me that I'd never heard of before happens to be this exporter out of Japan, Itochu. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. The ticker symbol for the ADR is I-T-O-C-Y, and uh, they basically move stuff around. And when I say stuff, you can see the description of stuff uh, right here on the second line. And uh, specializing in machinery, energy, and chemicals, those are some areas which have had quite a rebound. We'll take a look at it here in a second. And uh, again, with the recovering economy, not just in Japan, but in areas that they serve, uh, things are cooking along pretty well for them. So here's a look at the company on one of our charts. Um, the visual analysis suggests, again, an economically sensitive company, uh, which which had some rough moments like much much of the world back in this time frame. But uh, I'll tell you, when I first started looking at the company, I assumed that that had to be some type of a merger or acquisition to get that huge step change. And I went and checked the capital structure, did not find any inflection in either shares outstanding or long-term debt. So that's simply the company is the same company through that time frame. I was all prepared to expect that uh, step change having come from that. So it it is an interesting situation. Um, it's not a small company. It's not a new company. They actually date back to the mid 1850s, and uh, apparently fairly well managed. So again, if they they can grow at eight percent, they can achieve margins somewhere in that five percent range. And if a PE, I got a feeling that some of what they are looking at is an, ex an expectation of uh, better PEs in the future. Uh, anywhere from 8 to 10, anything which makes sense to you, you can pretty quickly get to a situation which is somewhat attractive. And it's probably worth being on some radar screens. They do have some liabilities, but a uh, decent amount of cash, really attractive interest rate on any debt that they do carry. And... Uh, Again, it's one that I'd never heard of before. We've added it to coverage at Manifest, and it might be one that uh, is worth at least keeping track of going forward. Any thoughts or comments from the audience, or Kim, anything you want to share? I always love it when we can find another stock that we can add. Yep, so we'll add that to our radar screen. I think one of the other features of this report, and this is a hallmark of Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway letters to shareholders, uh, he's never afraid to confess when he feels he's uh, not done very well. And uh, he talked in great detail about uh, paying too much for precision cast parts. They make highly specialized uh, metallic parts for aerospace and defense, and they just had a really rough run of it. And they probably did pay way too much for it. Uh, this is just a reminder that we've gone back and taken a look at the past, like things like the Kraft Heinz acquisition and just kind of wondered, because one of the things I've always noticed, and this goes all the way back to when they purchased and, and basically ripped the shares of Clayton Homes from our, from our, our fingers. And uh, for years, you guys have heard me say this at presentations, I think he owes us at least a dollar, maybe two dollars per share for the sh the shares that he took away of Clayton Holmes. He doesn't overpay very often. And uh, I do think that if you really dug into the Kraft Heinz situation, you, you find that situation where, uh, again, the returns were low single digits in some cases, depending on the assumptions that you make, maybe even negative. And that's a that's a typical, you know, M&A, you know, white shoe situation, which he doesn't do very much of. He, 
again, he being Berkshire Hathaway. But uh, in the case of precision cast parts, that was a prominent holding in the Mutual Club. So we were all fairly familiar with it at the Mutual Club of Detroit. And my impression was uh, that he probably paid too much for it uh, back a few years ago. And it's a mistake which cost them uh, upwards of $11 billion in, in write downs. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting to see them do a, a soul searching. Now, Ann Manning, I don't know if Ann's with us. If we check she the, is, the I believe. Meetings. Ann has suggested that it would be informative, and she probably thinks entertaining, that we go back and look at some of our decisions in this way and, and criticize our own uh, roundtable selections or whatever. And see if Ann wants to share anything about that recommendation. Well, I have, well, I think only you can unmute her. I can't, okay. I can't unmute her. Ann, raise your hand if you would like to uh, make a comment about that, because I do think it's a, a wonderful suggestion, even if it means that my pride will be uh, uh, bruised and battered. I don't see a hand up, so we'll just keep pressing on, but it's a good suggestion. Oh, let's go ahead and unmute Ann. Good afternoon, Ann. I, you have to unmute on your end. Try one more time. Okay, oh, you should be unmuted. Yeah. How are you, Ann? Uh, I'm doing fine. I didn't have my headphones on, so I had to get them on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just always thought that would be interesting. You know, like I told you in the email that we always seem to pat ourselves on the back for the good things we do. Yeah, yeah. But, but to me, I learn more from my mistakes. And so I thought that might, you know, not that y'all make that many. So I wonder, but, I wonder how we're going to identify these if we have to pick out our own mistakes, or if, if we could get, somehow get the audience to uh, to really rake us over the coals. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to proceed. But um, well, I was just thinking, you just look at some, what, what was your of uh, your picks for the past year, just like you do the uh, uh, deal we just had the other night where you got the awards. Uh huh. You just you just get your past year deal and say okay this didn't do as well as i thought and this is why i think maybe it didn't yeah i just think that would be uh, would be helpful when i when i hear you say that i also ratchet through the thought process of one year being too short to really reach conclusions and maybe even going back uh you know four or yeah. five years and that sort of thing yeah yeah that would you know that would probably work but i just i just like i said i find things more helpful in my mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we'll, we'll take that under advisement and I'll see if I can wrestle Kavula to the carpet and, and see if we can put <laughs> together something. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Ann. All right. Let's go ahead and keep pressing on. Some of you were here for my rant about analyst uh, chaos here a few weeks ago and, and uh, I received lots of helpful comments and constructive criticism about it. And, uh, I just want to share with you that uh, I'm not imagining this. Uh, I wish I were. And w one of the things I thought I would do just to illustrate how, how erratic some of this analyst stuff is, because keep in mind, we follow 2,500 companies now. So on a daily basis, we see some of these companies shifting around. This happens to, I'm picking a little bit here on, on uh, just a single value line analyst. But I just want you to get an appreciation for this is the value line company report three months ago versus the one that is in the current uh, update uh, for this week. And uh, I want to draw your attention to the red circle. I mean, three months ago, they were expecting uh, basically a four year or three to five year forecast low price of 75. And that changed virtually overnight to 450. And I just want you to get a feel for how turbulent this stuff can be uh, i'm not making this stuff up and um it really was whipsawing around much, many of the expectations for 2020 2021 and uh again you're looking at here this is obviously an unusual exceptional example but i just wanted you to get an or an idea for the order of magnitude of some of these shifts and expectations that can happen um it makes it tough. So again, this also is just a big reminder. 
This happens to be Moderna, one of the vaccine companies. And obviously with the pandemic and what they are working on right now, you have a pretty unusual situation. And I, I guess my uh, Cliff Notes version of this would, would be nobody knows where this is going. You know, what happens to this company after they get the vaccines, you know, all implemented? between them and J&J &J and Pfizer and all the other stuff, you know, what does it look like out here? Um, and the answer is nobody knows. And I, I, again, I think it's kind of illustrative of, if that's a, the proper pronunciation of that word, of operating without a whole lot of information. And one of the reasons that we love to see, you know, five to 10 years of operating history, uh, so we know how a company performs, during a recession. So again, less information, smaller company, fewer, fewer analysts, uh, volatile growth, volatile performance can lead to this type of situation. But again, I wanted to draw your attention to this notion of how volatile some of these expectations can get. All right. So with that in mind, what I did, what we usually do over a period of eight or nine weeks is update the expectations for 20, 21, 22, and uh, this stuff takes shape over a period of several weeks. And I said, the heck with that this year, we've got all that information now. We just need to suck it in for the, the value line uh, companies. There's about 1400 companies in the value line arithmetic average that are industrials. Again, we've thrown out the, set aside the banks and insurance companies, we are looking at industrial type companies where we care more about the percent net margin. So again, this is the median over time. And again, uh, just a reminder, the reason that we keep track of this is this is what messes with our stock studies. We've gone through a really tough period. Again, here's the recession of 2008, 2009. Notice the downdraft in the median uh, profitability back in that time frame. There were a few days during 2020 when the number was down here off the scale and then it shot back up and it basically was wobbling all over the place. Well, now these numbers are finally coming in and you, you, it basically does confirm the recessionary conditions, the distortions that you're going to see on, in the chasm as you do the analysis on stock selection guides. But what we want to draw the audience's attention to is expectations for 2021. 22 and 23, 25 will continue to take shape as Value Line does their updates. But notice these expectations. Now, they actually are dramatically lower than they were uh, a year ago. So they've actually come down quite a bit. But what you want to be aware of is the consensus expectation right now for these companies is an all time record. Coming out of this pandemic ridden economy. And then look and at Mark, so these two our numbers. readers, our, our, our audience needs to recognize that this is telling us this is the area of the sector of the market we need to look for stocks. Well, this is all of them, Kim. So it's, I mean, it's, yeah, we, we need, need to look for the companies that are behind those all time records. I, absolutely. But. I, I don't know. I guess my instinct is, do I really believe that we're going to have an all-time record profitability come the end of 2021? Uh, I have a hard time with that. Still do. We're almost a third of the way into 2021 right now. And uh, I, I just have, I mean, I think it's going to be better than 2020, obviously. But and then the, these two are still way up there. And, and now we're not picking on a single value line analyst here. We're talking about a whole bunch of smart people that are uh, that have an optimistic contagion going on. Uh, so I think if, if I'm doing a stock study for uh, an investment club and uh, I'm looking at my stock analysis, I am inclined to, uh, you know, run the study and then go back and run it with perhaps a 10 or 20% lower profit margin expectation and see if I still like the company just for a little bit more caution. I know that sounds incredibly bearish and a little bit pessimistic from what you usually hear from me, but I do think that there's a, there's an inordinate amount of uh, optimism here. And I have a lot of optimism. 
you know, ideologically. I have a lot of optimism. We're going to close with that. So any thoughts, anything, anything else you'd like to add to that, Kim, or does anybody in the audience have any questions? Well, Matt made a comment and I agree with it is that yes, it's exciting to see that the vaccines are coming out, that more people are getting them. It's going to, I don't think it's going to, flip on a switch that everything's going to be perfect, I could see at least another year, year and a half. Because when are, you know, when are we going to have people at a basketball game, at a baseball game, a live concert, all those people who were had working jobs before, who are going to have jobs again, the, re, uh, the restaurant industry, um, music industry and all that. It's going to take time. And mm -hmm. some of that news and that hype could all be baked in so i'm kind of in your camp mark of being have a healthy dose of skepticism yes there's going to be growth going forward but i don't know if it's going to be blowing everybody out of the water yeah it's just something to watch this is you know factual information this is where their opinions are today take it for what it's worth and be careful out there it's that simple all right here's our groundhog moment for this week um, again, we're not going to share this every week, only when we've got uh, perhaps some interesting snippets to, to toss at the audience. Um, by the way, yesterday, uh, two days ago, this number was minus 0.7%. Uh, yesterday was a great day in the stock market. It's now back up to a positive average. Um, this is actually a lower number than we've seen in recent years, where only 55 are now beating the market. Again, it's early. You guys all send me little letters saying, Mark, it's not a, mar it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. and uh, the top 40, Joseph O'Brien holds down the top. We'll take a look at Rob Martin's portfolio here in a minute. We are being invaded by a few groundhog, or excuse me, rhinos, including Berkshire Hathaway, by the way. A little manifest roundtable snuck in there. And uh, I actually was going to cut this off at like 25 or 30. You know, we've been publishing 40, and then I found a reason to leave it at 40. <laughs> to uh, get my name up in lights. So, you know, I got to grab every opportunity that I can for that. And then uh, we'll talk about Kathy when we're done here, but uh, ARC's Kathy Wood, that's ARC Investment. Uh, it, it's fascinating. You talk about uh, humility and I'm not picking on her. I, I, I think she's absolutely fantastic. I think she invests like we do. I think watching her will help us into some fantastic areas of innovation. Uh, but she would be 139th out of 142 right now. So when you talk about the humility that can be handed out by a, a stock market, that's all part of it. Any comments or questions on this, Kim? No, not for me. I just, you know, my crystal ball is not quite clear as to what's going to happen. And uh, I have had a few stocks of my own that did well and all of a sudden they didn't. So just have to wait and see. There are a, a few questions in the box of, do you think with what's going on and all this um, excitement and going forward, do you feel that this could have a negative effect on the market overall? Because everybody's thinking the market's gonna grow so much more. Could it be a little overzealous and um, well. make us, we talked a little bit about that a couple of weeks ago, Jim Cramer and his froth index or his froth meter or whatever he called it. Uh, yeah. Uh, any, any time that the exuberance gets up and I'm talking about real in-person psychology, uh, could even say psychiatry exuberance by individual investors when that gets uh, in the short term out of control. Cause I think, Everybody on that list, everybody in this room has a, a, a long-term, uh, fairly steady optimism. Uh, what happens over the short term, though, is you become vulnerable to corrections in bear markets. And yeah, that that possibility is higher today than it was, you know, X number of months ago. No doubt about it. Here's a quick look at Rob Martin's dashboard, just because we like to check in on what people are putting their money down on, their Groundhog Million. He went for six stocks, including a turnaround stock there, uh, Southwest Airlines, Intel, trying to 
get around an operating challenge. I did find it interesting that Genmark Diagnostics was in many Groundhog portfolios. In fact, we'll probably share a portfolio next week from uh, George Mack where he went through and identified consensus selections. Genmark is probably one of those. It's getting a lot of institutional attention also. Uh, monolithic Power, I believe, is in power supply to uh, uh, chip makers. BlackBerry, interesting on the list. I would have expected BlackBerry to be doing a little bit better. That's been kind of bumpy. It's one of the meme stocks at uh, Reddit along with GameStop. So that one will be a bit bumpy, but we'll see how that uh, measures out. So good luck, Rob. He's moved into second place. All right, and I thought we would close with uh, one of the things we'd like to point out that uh, in some of the trade journals, some of the publications, in this case, it's Chain Store Age, CSA. It's a retail trade journal, you can find stuff like this, which can prompt interesting thinking. Uh, I've seen Ken and his investment clubs do this in a, a really nice way over the years. Um, this is an article talking about taking dormant and nearly abandoned mall space and converting it into residential property. Fascinating concept. Uh, it's as fascinating to me as seeing an old big box retailer converted into a storage unit. Um, which is also going on, which I would put in the, kind of the same category of repurposing uh, space in ways that we probably didn't see coming. When you see an old Kmart or an old Sears turned into a, a used or it public storage outlet, it's it's kind of uh, well, there's there's some type of an oxymoron or a paradox in there somewhere. But one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up here, just as a notion of the way to think about the Kramer reopening stocks. I keep saying turnaround, we really meant reopening. And this dovetails into some of that thinking a few minutes ago. There is optimism, some of it's very justified. Um, in a recovering or reopening economy, notice the card holding companies that are on there, the airline, some of the entertainment and recreation stocks that appear. And uh, the one that applies to the concept being described, this Simon Property Group is in commercial real estate. And it'd be interesting to see how that concept of residential repurposing or conversion uh, could offer an answer to a, a, what I think is a fairly, I, I have a friend that's in commercial real estate and it's a bloodbath. It's, uh, it's kind of a terrible situation. And if they found uh, a way to create demand with residential repurposing, I think that uh, that would, uh, that could be a, an interesting opportunity and a solution and maybe alleviate some of the pain that's being experienced in commercial real estate right now. So that's my well, thought. You know, that, that brings to mind, one of the stocks we might need to look at is Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes? Yes, they were doing a whole bunch of repurposing. They had a great big development in Texas that was going to be a multifunctional with you know, shops, grocery stores, apartments, everything all together. Do you have a ticker for that one, Kim, just so we can let the audience know? I know, is it HH? I believe it's HH. Well, somebody will give it to us. We'll share, we'll share H that ticker. Yeah, HH. It's a good, good topic to dig into. And again, think about a little bit differently as an area of opportunity. And again, in a, an alleviation of some pain that's going on. And that, that can be a, a good thing to be involved in on the investment side. All right. All right. Just a momentary celebration here of, of 10 cup. Um, I guess I, I, I'm kind of numb to this cause I've been doing this so long, but that line is so vertical. Now it's, it's given me G force willies. Um, I, we're, we're in danger of taking out 4 million and we just took out 3 million four months ago. And so it's kind of a fascinating thing to watch. And again, it's a very mechanical, almost robotic approach to investing uh, using the principles put forth by Babson and Nicholson. And uh, it's, it's not terribly flashy, everybody. You know, let's take a look at the portfolio. Um, here is the, the current portfolio. There are companies in here that I would be reluctant or skeptical to invest in but uh, for a few of them but they ended up at the top of the screening results and ended up in the portfolio so there some of them have performed absolutely magically 
uh, since they were added, but it's a, it's a pretty formidable collection of companies, including many community favorites. Um, I set the two banks aside there. That's our horse race between Ken and myself. He picked first financial bank shares. I picked Great Southern, put the same amount of money into them. I had a huge lead until now. So I don't think he's here to enjoy the fact that he's taken the lead in the horse race. But uh, uh, I don't know, Mark. I think your A2 Milk is doing quite well. A2 Milk's doing okay. It's, it's We're hanging in there. So, uh, yeah, the audience has corrected me. My Howard Hughes is Howard Hughes Corporation, so it's HHC. HHC is in Charlie. Okay, that's worth taking a look at. Uh, again, the concept of repurposing and moving on. So that is the 10 cup portfolio. To follow along, you can uh, follow that link online. Then the last couple of slides to close it down. I thought we were going to be adding a book to the list courtesy of Warren Buffett. He actually mentions Phil Fisher's 1954 text, um, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, 1958, excuse me. And uh, just, just wanted to remind that we had already selected that one and talked about it. So I thought Buffett was going to add to our bullish library, but uh, that'll have to come later. And there's Mr. Buffett and Snowball there on the right. Just a quick reminder that we archive and put the recording of this session on YouTube so you can go back and revisit it. Again, we'll send you copies of the slides. If you're a Manifest Investing subscriber, first of all, thank you. We love you. Um, in the forum, you can see the, the slides and the links to all of these. But we do archive all of the webcasts that we do, including some of our special educational sessions, and the monthly roundtables. So just so you know, that uh, Successful Investing 3 conference is the next edition of what you see here, which was Successful Investing 2. Here's that panel where the, the Warren Buffett Stone Co. idea came from. All right, we'll close with just a couple of pictures. This one is actually from the report for Itucci that company I'd never heard of before. Um, again, out of Japan, founded in 1858. The, that's the actual founder's name there at the bottom. And the, the annual report's worth a, a closer look to try to understand their business. And it's, uh, I just find it very culturally pleasing. And with that, we'll leave with a quote from the Berkshire Hathaway letter to in, investors. It's, uh, part of the text this year and uh, that's the Mackinac Bridge by the way in the background between uh, the lower and upper peninsulas of Michigan along with a little bit of ice piled up but uh, I think that's a worthy quote today many people forge similar miracles throughout the world creating a spread of prosperity that benefits all humanity but there's never been an incubator for unleash unleashing human potential like America despite some severe interruptions We've seen a few of those in our investing careers. Our country's economic pro progress has been breathtaking. I mean, go back and look at that profitability chart. That's actually a breathtaking uh, renaissance of enterprise. Beyond that, we retain our constitutional aspiration of becoming a more perfect union. Amen. Progress has been slow, sometimes discouraging, but we move forward and we'll continue to do so. And Buffett's unwavering conclusion, never bet against America. I think he means that very broadly, but uh, uh, I certainly don't want to be accused of worship, but I do have a lot of respect for Warren Buffett and what he's done and what his team has done. Uh, they account for a very large slice of American enterprise. In fact, they just calculated that they have the largest slice of ca capital equipment of any company, outdistancing number two by nearly 20%. So uh, it's 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 huge, and uh, I continue to recommend the HBO special if you want to get to know him on a more personal basis. Um, it's just a it's just a good thing to to keep in in mind. And we come back to this notion of patience and discipline, and it just oozes. Um, Kim described some of that for you when she was talking about Omaha and the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, this like-minded patience and discipline. 
And so, Kim, I'll leave it with you for some closing thoughts. Well, the biggest thing um, I've always learned is uh, I, I, I listened and read. Um, first, I, I heard it on uh, YouTube, and then I read it that um, the three types of stocks that Mr. Um, Charlie Munger feels that you need to have are spinoffs, copycats, and um, carnivores. And it's really a lot of fun when you can find a copycat stock that Mr. Buffett has and you, you look at it and you go, what in the world is he thinking? So it makes us open our mind as investors to say, what is he seeing that I'm not? And I think as when you follow these great investors, if you're, you know, you look at Warren Buffett as to what stocks he's got in his portfolio, um, it's a way to make us all better to look at what some of these great investors have who have these great capital allocation skills, because I'm all about capital allocation to, um, open up your mind and open up your thought process of maybe somebody sees something that you don't that can be very profitable. So, awesome. yeah. yeah. Yeah, we do get better together and we're grateful to all of you for going along on this journey. Um, I will go ahead and close down here in a second. I did want to make sure everybody's aware of that opportunity provided by our friends at Benzinga. Uh, let me see if I can jump off of the thing uh, on the manifest investing web page uh, uh, the very first entry here is kathy wood arc investments on benzinga she's going to do an in-person interview with uh, jason rasnick here in detroit tomorrow afternoon so you can actually uh, access that at the site and again i wasn't i'm not being uh not picking on them at all uh they've had a slow start this year but who doesn't have a slow start after your last five or six years have looked like this. And they are the number one ranked term in ter fund in terms of relative performance. It's an exchange traded fund, ARKK. And uh, a lot of people at within the manifest investing community have taken to following them as a source of investing ideas. And uh, if not investing directly in the fund. So your opportunity to uh, listen in and uh, even submit a question is right there for you. So with that, Kim, I'm going to go ahead and shut down the recording. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Thanks, everybody, for being here and joining us. Take care.